Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 12062. This is Alternative Dispute Resolution. We're into week five of term two in 2017. Tonight we're dealing primarily with conciliation and our main emphasis is on establishing what conciliation is, contrasting it to some degree with mediation, expert appraisals, and do so for the most part in the context of workplace disputes. After all, that's where conciliation and arbitration emanated from uh, its inclusion in the Constitution, one of the rare areas of ADR that does have some history before the 70s and the 80s. There are a number of different definitions for conciliation. Um, there are different practitioners that, um, in a sense, almost treat mediation and conciliation interchangeably. It's still very young, so it's not settled yet. There was an attempt to have a settled definition through NADRAC. However, NADRAC is no longer with us, although we still use many of the NADRAC uh, terminologies. I'm just going to share the screen for a moment to highlight some of the definitions that we used in NADRAC. You should see my screen now, my Word document. And um, NADRAC indicated that um, uh, media or conciliation was a process in which the parties to a dispute, with the assistance of the practitioner, that is the conciliator of course, try to identify issues in dispute, develop options, consider alternatives, and endeavour to reach an agreement. I mean, that looks exactly like mediation, doesn't it? Um, the conciliator must have an advisory role on the content or the outcome, but not determinative. All right, well there we can see some difference between conciliation and mediation in its purest sense, in that in mediation we don't have a an advisory role um, although it depends on the definition that uh, you use because many people talk about mediation being facilitative or advisory so if we're going to choose advisory mediation it looks very similar to conciliation so there are some gray areas the um wide uh, sorry the um, wide variations in many for conciliation can also include processes to resolve complaints and disputes. So you'll often see conciliation used in the context of um, what ombudsmen and other dispute um, practitioners attempt to do by resolving complaints. So that commentary is from NADRAC, which is the National Alternative Dispute Resolution and Advisory Council, and that was from uh, 2003. Now, Formally, um, in, a more, in a more structured sense, NADRAC defined conciliation this way. So interventionalist um, mediation, like a compulsory conference in um, uh, QCAT. That's my ad addition, that, that phrase. So NADRAC says conciliation is a form of ADR process where the parties identify the issues, develop the options, consider the alternatives, try to reach an agreement, we went through that before, the conciliator may provide advice, may have expert, professional expertise. I'll just stop there. If you're a practitioner advising parties to a dispute, you may wish to consider conciliation where there are technical issues or you believe that having someone with a particular professional expertise may assist the process. Um, for example, if we take mediation in its purest form, in a facilitative sense, non-advisory, in some ways it doesn't matter about the professional expertise or experience of the mediator about the content of the dispute. If you're dealing with something which is technical or where you need someone who can speak with authority when providing some commentary in relation to options or, or possible outcomes, that's where you may wish to choose a, a media or conciliator with professional expertise. It might be a lawyer, it might be an engineer, it might be some other profession. So conciliation is like mediation, but the conciliator's role is more directive and advisory. And of course, it can come about as a result of a number of different uh, paths. It can be voluntary or it can be court ordered. The reason I'm stressing these points is that when it comes to the take-home exam, um, you're likely to see, well, 
a possible question, which is along the lines of the questions I've set the last couple of years, is to present a problem and to put you in the shoes of a first-year lawyer giving advice to the client as to the um, best and most appropriate options for the ADR. So you might want to con consider conciliation in that context uh, if there is a special um, expertise required in that situation. All right, any questions so far? Okay, well, we'll move on then. Um, and I will refer to a few uh, different issues tonight. <clears throat> One thing that we do need to do is consider the um, definitions from different organisations. NADRAC um, is no longer with us. It was a statutory body. It was independent. Um, it was established in the mid 90s and uh, it concluded in late 2013. Essentially, the um, uh, federal government decided to streamline operations, um, but it did make a substantial contribution to ADR. Um, some of the things that I, NADRAC commenced are still with us, such as the Mediator Standards Board and the National Mediator um, Accreditation System. Okay, so coming back to conciliation and definitions for conciliation, one that I probably favour uh, is one that is reflected through the Attorney General in Victoria's um, working party on alternative dispute resolution. I'll bring it up on my other screen. This is more along the lines of how I see conciliation compared to mediation. So pretty simple, cons consensual process. It can be imposed, but normally it's consensual. Third party conciliator attempts to bring the parties to a resolution. To achieve that, may meet and discuss matters with them independently and jointly and may indicate to the parties the strengths and weaknesses of their position and may suggest solutions. I think that's probably the, the right way to look at conciliation if you're trying to distinguish it between mediation and um, uh, conciliation as such. All right, so um, I hope that's given you some basic idea of the way I see it. The um, work of uh, Bryson is, ref is important. We'll refer to an article which I'm attempting to source at the moment. And I know, um, I think, was it Paul, you were trying to chase this article as well? So in the leopard shall lie down with the kid. I'm, we've got it, uh, there's a reference to it in, I think, Westlaw, um, but I can't find the actual article. The librarian's onto it. I've searched through Osley. The librarian assures me there's nothing wrong with my um, uh, technique, research technique. We've always been able to find it before, but it's been removed from certain catalogs. So we're chasing it now. So what I'll do is um, I'll refer you to parts uh, of that um, article which are in the study guide and we'll supplement that as well with some other comments. What I hope to do tonight also is go through some of the uh, questions that we've been lagging behind on in the tutorials. So. Um, with any luck, we can do that. So let's have a look at Bryson. Um, you would have read in his material uh, some comments about how to go about the process of dealing with mediations. And one of the things that he talks about is the power versus empowerment models. And let's call this up on the screen again. And I hope that you can read this when I share the screen. So here we have a little flow chart in relation to empowerment. So what we need to do is establish the issues and construct an agenda. Sorry, I'll stop moving this soon. So establish the issues, construct an agenda. That's pretty common practice. We do that based on parties perceptions and interests. That's really important. Again, what we're trying to do in conciliation, like we are in mediation, is um, talk about interests. But we do that from the perspective of, of the, the party's perceptions. And then when we embark on this empowerment model, 
and I'll just expand that a bit so we can see the heading. When we go through this uh, empowerment model, what we're looking to do is focus on those interests rather than the positions. Again, that's pretty common to mediation, and that means discovering the interests and the positions and the issues and get the parties communicating directly with each other. One important thing that a conciliator can do that sometimes a mediator can't is reference external objective criteria and use that as a negotiation position. In a purely facilitative role, the mediator is, is really looking for the parties to make the running. But where we have a conciliation, the parties can use objective criteria. By that I mean they can bring in quasi-evidence to assist in the process. Sometimes that quasi-evidence is the evidence they give themselves as a, an expert in a field. Other times it might be external evidence um, based on value. Look, a good example of that might be if there's a, a dispute about the value of a car, well, just bring in the red book values. Mediators can't really do that. And if the parties don't think about doing those sorts of things, then sometimes it can be frustrating. Conciliator can bring that in and say, look, here we are. Here's um, because they've got, a, they've got that advisory role. Moving on, um, under the empowerment model, there's a, there's a debate and bargain in terms of legal demands identify the areas of agreement, disagreement emerging from the negotiation process. That's really important because it's a fallback position. And um, if you're involved in a commercial uh, conciliation situation, you want to at least walk away with some positive. If you can't settle a matter outright, which is always the uh, ambition, do try very hard to have the parties at least agree on important material facts have them agree on the legal issues and then have them agree on the points of disagreement um, and document that. That will help in terms of future negotiations. If it's a conciliation which is um, backed by legislation, that may then become the order uh, of the tribunal or the court. And again, like mediation, under the empowerment model, Bryson says, go through a range of possibilities, devise different plans, brainstorm the options, and, and uh, try and um, uh, encourage the parties to give and take in relation to alternative resolutions or solutions. So again, this is another area of practice where the mediators find it a little frustrating in that whilst they can encourage the parties to brainstorm, if the parties aren't particularly inventive, it can stall pretty quickly. However, in a conciliation situation, the conciliator is entitled to add to the list of possibilities, those things that they wish, may wish to consider and actively be involved in that brainstorming exercise. So when I talk about brainstorming, it's really quite simple. What I'm suggesting is that um, all sorts of different options are put forward. doesn't matter how silly they are. It uh, doesn't matter initially how unworkable they might seem. Put them up and it's a way of moving forward. And then finally, under the empowerment model, conclude the negotiations, work out the agreement and uh, reconsider the interests. Okay, so when you look at that empowerment model as advanced by Bryson, in many ways that looks like a mediation, but a mediation on steroids, a mediation where the conciliator has this active role and obligation really to lend a hand to the parties. Lawyers generally prefer to be conciliators, I think, because they're trained to be proactive, to look for issues, to look for solutions. And sometimes in a mediation sense, lawyers uh, aren't necessarily good. That brings us back to the first question in the problems, and that was, um, can a lawyer truly be a mediator as well? We certainly can, but it sometimes always, uh, it doesn't always go um, in a complementary fashion to the way that lawyers are trained to think. All right, let's have a look at the alternative to the empowerment model, and uh, that is the power model. The empowerment model, really, to my mind, is, if you like, a, a standard uh, form of conciliation. The power model takes things a little further. My aim now is to find where my mouse is.
these Bluetooth mouse, uh, these uh, mice that are Bluetooth are great when they work. Um, just bear with me, we'll share the screen. Now the power model is where we establish the issues from available information. We do so in accordance with statutory rules. The positions are stated by the parties. The opening demands are brought to the table quickly. There's an interrogation of supporting information. Precedents are called for to establish the party's positions. And then there's a debate which goes along the lines of legal demands. And if you look at what is described here in the bottom right hand corner, it looks very much like distributive negotiation as opposed to principled negotiation. In that under this power model, Bryson is suggesting that a way to conciliate is to use persuasion, to use carrot stick, to give and take exchange of concessions, and only sort of lastly develop new options. But in many ways, this power model is, how do I put it, more to the point, straight to the point. And um, there are sometimes uh, good reasons for using this power model as opposed to the empowerment model. This is really a choice for the conciliator to make which way they go in that regard. Uh, we know that this is now, the power model is starting to move very much away from the mediation situation that we would normally see. So why would a um, mediator choose to go with a power model and what does it really mean? Well, again, there's some commentary in the study guide. Do have a look at that. And if I could put it this way, I think, um, firstly, it's not likely that the conciliator is going to announce that I am now going into power mode as opposed to empowerment mode. The parties may not realise what's happening. It's a choice for the conciliator to, to make. The safe choice is empowerment mode. That's the traditional mode. Power mode can be used, but do so sparingly. In the notes, there are some guidelines as to when you might wish to go into power mode if you are a conciliator. Have a look at those and uh, try to think about that in the context of any dispute that you may be involved in, either as the ADR practitioner or party representing a disputant. So power mode applies generally if you've got sophisticated expert players. Insurers, lawyers, they want to get straight to it. It's not going to be a therapeutic exercise not necessarily too worried about having a future um, relationship with each other that is therapeutic. They know in all likelihood insurers will have an ongoing relationship um, with each other, but they can get straight to the point. They, the power mode will work better where you've got an agenda which is fairly straightforward um, and you've got clear issues of causation, which means that there are less options that are available. Um, the power mode is really where the conciliator takes control. And we see this a lot with the, perhaps if I could say, the more experienced lawyers will often go straight into power mode. They will say, well, we've got some very clear legal issues here. We've got some very clear precedents. We've got some parties that are sophisticated. Um, these are the points that we need to discuss. Let's get into it. Um, as opposed to the empowerment model, which is more like mediation, where the mediator is working with the parties to try and encourage them to come up with their own agendas, their own issues, etc. I'm not saying that um, the power model in conciliation is a determinative process, far from it. But what I guess I'm, I am trying to say is that in all of these ADR processes, it's not necessarily clear cut um, which way, how you pigeonhole something. And there's a, it's a, a graduation of uh, different terms. Um, if parties want a quick resolution, 
then probably go into power mode. Now, there is a completely different reason why the conciliator may go into power mode, and that is this. I mentioned at the start that power mode is often used by conciliator where you have sophisticated repeat players. The other time that it can be useful is if we have the reverse of that and we have a sophisticated uh, player and we have someone that is just totally unsophisticated. If the conciliator goes into empowerment model, there is a real risk here that the party that has little experience, little knowledge, little support or, not, or backup may simply not, may not be able to mount a case because to some degree, going into a mediation and ADR is still adversarial. You still have to make your case. You still have to argue your point and, and persuade. So going into power mode provides an opportunity for the conciliator to protect uh, and guide the other party by taking control. All right, so that's Bryson's two models of conciliation, the power and empowerment. Are there any questions about that? When you might use it, do you disagree with my summary of what Bryson is saying or when you might use it? All good? All right. Um, as always, when you're going into these sessions, if you're uh, representing a party, you need to prepare appropriately, prepare appropriately. And that um, means going back to what we discussed in weeks two and three about advising your client what to do and also um, you taking control of the things that you can do um, in preparation. Now, I mentioned that conciliation is used in different forums. Um, there is, of course, the Fair Work Commission. We'll talk about that shortly. But the other one um, that you often hear conciliation is in the family law court um, context or the Federal Circuit Court of Australia context in relation to parenting disputes. Has anyone come across any reading to do with family law parenting? Has anyone decided that that is going to be their dispute for ass assessment number one? Yes, Paul, very good. So, Paul, hopefully you've come across some of those guidelines. Karen says someone has in their group, that's good. Always an interesting area. Um, some good videos, actually, on family law disputes from the Legal Aid Office in Western Australia, from memory. So, do have a look out for that. Okay. Um, so, the Conciliation Conference or the process in the family law arena takes the form of um, a case assessment conference. Um, if there's a disagreement about financial issues, parenting can be discussed in that forum as well. But where there's a conciliation conference, um, it will be compulsory. So even though these ADR principles commenced on the basis that they would be voluntary, there are many circumstances where attendance is compulsory. And the um, instructions that are provided can often form the basis of an order um, beyond that. Now, before we get to that stage of it being in court, um, under the current regime, where there is a dispute between parents of children, there is a, a need for a family law conference. Now, this is an area that you may have, oh, so with, there's a question about the assessment. With the assessment, and I'll just digress for a moment, can we pretend that our parties have legal representation? Uh, you can, yep, you can do that. All right, so coming back to the family law issue, um, we have the family law conference. Now, have a look at section um, 601 of the Family Law Act. Uh, the idea of that is to ensure that the parties uh, who would become litigants make a genuine effort to resolve that dispute before a family dispute resolution practitioner. So it's an FDR process. This is an area that um, many of you may wish to uh, practice in. So a family dispute resolution practitioner or a, family dis a, fam a dispute resolution practitioner 
is defined in Section 4 of the Act, and um, that's something that uh, uh, is critical in terms of your understanding of Section 601. I'm just calling up the section now. Yep. So the family dispute um, resolution has a meaning that's given to it in Section 10 F of the Act and a family dispute resolution practitioner has a meaning given to it by Section 10 G of the Act. So that's the Family Law Act. So if you're interested in having a dispute around family law parenting or you're advising parties to that or you wish to become a family dispute resolution practitioner, then do have a look at um, section 601 of the Family Law Act. Also have a look at section 10, um, which, which is uh, uh, referred to in the definition section, which is section four of the Family Law Act. So the idea is that um, before a party is entitled to initiate proceedings for family law uh, to do with parenting, they must have a certificate from the Family Dispute Resolution Practitioner, uh, essentially saying that they've made a genuine effort to resolve the dispute. In reality, these certificates are issued uh, when one party simply fails to attend, uh, which is quite common, and it's usually the party that has the child with him or her, so they don't see the need to go to court. Everything's fine. Thank you very much. I don't need this Family Dispute Resolution uh, Conference to proceed. That's a very dangerous practice. Um, it, section six, six, sorry, 60 I, I am talking about, not 60, 601. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, so it is very important that you um, look at having that certificate ready to go. And um, I'm just looking at the section. I've been saying 601. Yes, sorry. The, the I looks like a, a one. So it's a six, 60 capital I is the section of the Act. And I'll just bring that up on the screen if I can. Um, and it's all about attending the family law, family dispute resolution before applying for an order under the um, Family Law Act. No, it's not coming up on the screen readily, so I won't worry about that. But thank you. That's 60 I. Um, the um, main issues that we're talking about tonight relate to workplace. The workplace disputes relate to the Fair Work Commission and the com attendance at a compulsory conference is, is voluntary, but it's not really voluntary. Um, if you have an opportunity to attend, then you should definitely attend uh, at that uh, conference. One thing that is um, unusual about that uh, commission is that unrepresented parties, unrepresented parties have effectively a cooling off provision and uh, that gives them an opportunity to opt out of any agreement. Okay, so what do you need to do if you're preparing for attendance at a Fair Work Commission conference? We'll just... Um, consider some of the, the things. The first is that you need to make sure about the logistics, the date, the time, the place. Make sure that you um, talk about any issues that cannot be resolved if you think that they can't be resolved during the course of that conference. It's important to go into it uh, with your client understanding the worst alternative to a, a negotiated dispute and the best alternative to a negotiated dispute. That's no different to any other preparation that you need for the mediation or conciliation. And um, it's important that you think about what you're going to say, of course, um, and go into it with a um, clear mind as to whether you want reinstatement or compensation. Um, Having a number of options available is always important, but you need to consider those generally before you go in. And uh, remember that the um, uh, Commission has wide power in terms of uh, what um, it needs to, uh, or what it, it can do to um, 
deal with those parties. Uh, now, just speaking of the federal jurisdiction, you would have seen in um, many pieces of legislation, for example, and it's important to have a look at this, the Civil Disputes Resolution Act 2011, it's Commonwealth legislation, and that is um, an obligation imposed upon parties to undertake a genuine effort to settle the matter. We see that a lot in processes, and um, in, the, in the notes there is some commentary from the case of Superior IP International against a Hearn Fox patent, uh, which is a 2012 FCA case. In that case, there were some concerns about whether, in fact, the genuine effort was made, and the uh, court determined that uh, where the requirements of the Act had not been complied with, then non-compliance goes to the question of costs. So a successful party could end up uh, actually losing um, by having to pay the other side's costs. So keep that in mind in terms of uh, a penalty for not making a genuine effort. All right, are there any questions about what we've discussed in general terms tonight? Okay. Yeah, just out of curiosity, John, can I ask a question? Yes, Dave. Yeah, um, so in, have you ever come across um, uh, conciliations where um, they involve anti-discrimination in the workplace? Uh, yes, yes, um, and there are a few different forums for that. Uh, so we do, we do anti-discrimination work uh, at QCAT, um, and uh, yes, so, uh, but I'm not sure I've got any particular comments about that. Um, let's see, what can I say? The um... the reason the reason why I was asking that is because um, you mentioned that mainly conciliations are dealing with family law, and I just mm -hmm. wanted to see if um, there was any other areas other than family. Yeah, sure. Um, well, certainly, I guess the Australian Human Rights Commission, uh, that's an important area. Uh, that deals with disputes about age discrimination or asylum seekers and refugees. So it's got a wide range of different uh, dispute areas. The other one, uh, and see, a lot of these are Commonwealth, you see, um, because it all relates to the um, Commonwealth Constitution, the power given to the Commonwealth to make laws in relation to conciliation, and also the um, uh, Civil Liability Act, which imposes this obligation for uh, genuine disputes. Another one is the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, the AAT, Commonwealth, that, that deals with conciliation work as well. Uh, I've mentioned the Family Court of Australia and the Federal Circuit Court. Both of those deal with conciliation issues. Other than that, um, oh, so the case for the um, genuine effort, it's in actually in the study guide. Uh, so I'll refer you back to the study guide for that one. The other place, I mentioned the Fair Work Commission, so that deals with unfair dispute, unfair um, dismissal disputes. Another one that we see in the Commonwealth level is the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal, and that deals with um, resolving disputes um, between complainants and superannuation providers. And that's pretty closely allied to the Financial Ombudsman Service. So that's, again, that's Commonwealth and it uh, offers free dispute resolution services to customers of financial services uh, pr providers. See, those last two are a little bit more along the lines of the other meaning for conciliation that we talked about, which is where you've got consumers dealing with um, an ombudsman or an ombudsman type body uh, to deal with complaints. At a co uh, that's at a Commonwealth level, at a state level, um, the Department of Justice and Attorney General has some conciliation um, powers. In particular, have a look at the Office of the Commissioner for Body Corporate and Community Management, the BCCM, and, and of course, private organisations. So, for example, universities like this has a internal conciliation procedures. So there are a lot of different organisations that do have conciliation procedures available to them, but they don't always fit within the definitions, which makes it really confusing.
because you're saying you're calling this a conciliation. It doesn't look like the NAD, conciliation under NADRAC. And, and that's the problem. There are many different types of uh, definitions for mediations and uh, some voluntary, some not voluntary, uh, such as um, what we've talked about tonight with Fair Work Commission. But, um, oh, and so just coming back to that case, I've got it here, Superior IP International against Ahern. All right. Uh, so tonight, have a look at the Fair Work provisions um, about conciliation. Definitely have a look at the Family Law Conference provisions, 60I, not 601, 60I. Um, have a look at what it means to be a dispute resolution practitioner, what they do. I'd even look as, have a look at what, it, what you need to do to become one because it'll always be a growing area of practice. Uh, think about what you need to do in preparing for a mediation. And uh, do have a look at those comments by Bryson about what it means to uh, be involved as a, as a conciliator, either um, in the empowerment model or the um, power model. All right. The other thing that I wanted to talk about tonight was some of the um, questions that we've been dealing with. I noticed that people are starting to drop off on their answers. Uh, which we don't want. We do want you to look at those questions and answer them. So if you can bear with me a moment, I'm just going to call up the Moodle page and we'll look at some of those questions. I don't know how many screens you all work with. I work with a couple and um, they're not quite the same size. So there's always little adjustments that need to be made. Okay, so we're getting there, sorry. The first thing I wanted to do was talk about 12 Angry Men. Has everyone seen it? Because I looked tonight and there were no answers to any of the questions to that problem. Does that mean that we haven't seen it yet? Because that would be a mistake. You need to, to watch that movie. It's really important. Okay, so question three of, sorry, in week three, we deal with negotiation. I'm just going to share the screen. Sorry to take a while. I'm getting there. All right. So week three, we've got our Moodle page. Um, we had the question about... 12 Angry Men. And thank you very much for those that did offer answers in relation to the first two weeks. But as I said, we've, we've stopped now all of a sudden. And now I've got a, a screen that seems to be frozen. All right, we'll do it this way. All right, so... The um, question asked you to consider the 12 angry men. And I didn't see any answers. I take it that you've seen the movie. We have, Karen's nodding, yes. If you haven't, please do that. We've got a break next week, so you've got some time. It's really good movie to watch. Um, the first thing to do is have a look at the judge when giving his address to the jury. The body language is very negative and um, obviously that's something that's easily picked up on. But you'll notice in the movie that um, the jurors also have their own distinct body language. And um, the point that I'm making is that in these things, body language is always very uh, important. So Karen said, yep, um, the judge talks monotone, is fiddling with something, appears disinterested and probably more interested in lunch. Inside the jury room, people have their own nonverbal language. Consider that. 
And remember the exercise that I gave you, just out of interest. When you're speaking with people, without necessarily telling them, just try different forms of body language, try different forms of eye contact, try different forms of uh, tone of voice, and see if you get different reactions. Um, and then try to work that into your skill set um, so that you're aware of it. There are some issues to do with um, persuasion for juror number eight, who tries to convince other jurors of the um, uh, validity of the argument, but does it well, and I think in a principled um, uh, negotiation style. So have a look at the way in which juror number eight goes about testing and retesting the evidence, looking at it from a different perspective, but not rushing in and uh, making sure that the parties are open to be persuaded before leaping in to actually change their mind. Um, the way that build, juror number eight builds alliances, now importantly, makes concessions. And that's a really important thing, uh, that sometimes the best way to obtain what you want is to make appropriate and necessary concession, to anticipate offers and reframes. And really importantly is this, what stands out with no, juror number eight to my mind is his patience, his timing is excellent, but he's right on top of the information. He knows his stuff. And what it comes back to is this, that when you're going into a conciliation or a mediation, either as the ADR practitioner or you are representing a party, or you are the party, knowledge is extremely important, which comes back to your preparation. So exercise for this week um, is have a look at 12 Angry Men. Please add some comments. I know that's um, on the study guide, or that's the question for week three, but we can go back and uh, talk about that uh, later uh, in, in the next week or two. After that, we'll move on to um, study guide questions. Uh, I've got some of my own thoughts, but I'm reluctant to put them on uh, Moodle if nobody's going to offer anything first. So remember, of course, that if you do take time to write your notes, put them on the Moodle, that becomes your copyright. And if others want to use them in the exam, on the take-home exam, they have to reference your, your material. So uh, it's, it's worthwhile going through the exercise and adding to the uh, body of work that you're adding. Okay, um, well look, thank you very much for your patience. I'm sorry I got the section number wrong. Thank you very much for correcting me. That was excellent. Was that you, Steve? Uh, no, I forget who it was, sorry, but thank you very much, I really appreciate it. Are there any questions before we wrap up? Remember next week is a holiday, so no work to do. No, not joining us uh, next week. All right. All the best. We'll see you then. Um, if you get your groups, let me know. Okay. Bye then. Thanks, John.